This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. So this is all done. We can lower the table, and then we can start taking the painting out of the clampinator. Okay. I'm gonna just start releasing pressure on this side, just okay. lightly. Um, you just wanna kinda do it evenly so that there's no instantaneous release, mm -hmm. just in case the wood still wants to move a little bit. You just kinda wanna slow that down. Um, so loosening these up. And then we can start loosening those. So actually you can begin These loosening ones. the vertical ones. Yeah. And we're just looking for enough release to get the little blocks out. Okay. And then we can, oh, you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the wood moving a little bit. Interesting. And that's all right. Even under traction, even if we clamp it in its natural curve, mm -hmm. you know, we've introduced glue, uh, we've introduced pressure, and the wood is going to spring back a little bit. So as long as it doesn't explode or catch fire. <laughs> I'll just stand over here. Thank you're you. Right. Spontaneous combustion of a very old painting would be bad. The little blocks are great because they won't stick to the painting, either the um, varnish or any glue that seeps out. Uh, you know, we don't want anything sticking. So now we can just slide the gantry over. Yep, I know. That's they're all satisfying. falling. Yeah, yeah. Gonna yeah, and so then I can slide the painting out. All right. Okay. Well, the painting did not fall apart. Yay. <laughs> so that is our first measure of success. So we've glued it back together, but it's still not really structurally sound. Right. It's only, remember, it's like a quarter of an inch thick. Some of these joints are starved or just not great. Mm -hmm. And my big concern is that if we just keep it like this and we put it in the frame, as the painting continues to move, expand and contract, the stress and tension on these joints is gonna cause them to burst or, or open up and that's gonna be a big problem. Uh, also, just in handling it, I can feel how flimsy it is. So I'm not okay with just this. If we take a look at the back, you can see some of those issues presented as well. Even though on the front we have a really good contact in places, <laughs> I mean, this is really open. There are big gaps in here. This is huge yeah, gaps. <laughs> right. And so the panel has been glued back together with its correct curvature mm -hmm. and we've aligned everything, yet this is the best we're going to get. And so this is just not acceptable. Um, and it's not through any fault of our own. I mean, if you look at the areas where there were just checks and cracks, mm -hmm. there's great glue squeeze out. And that's an indication that we've got good glue penetration. Okay. But these, mm -mm, and so I'm not okay with leaving these as is. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are at this table yeah. with this rig. Uh, so this is a router sled. It can move on two different axes. And what it's gonna allow us to do is to put into play this approach that we talked about earlier, whereby we create a groove and then we put an inlay. And we're gonna do that effectively right along each seam. Removing this wood isn't really that big of a problem because it's it's not providing any structural support. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole function of doing this repair is to make sure that the painting lasts, not temporarily, but as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So we're going to route out a channel and then we're going to inlay uh, this another piece of wood to give us more surface area for the glue and a stronger piece of wood for a stronger joint. The whole premise of doing an inlay is predicated on getting perfectly aligned joints on all of these four sides. Yeah. If one of them is two degrees off, starved glue joint. Mm -hmm. If the router s curves, we it's won't. It's not gonna fit. It's yeah. not gonna fit, right. So keeping everything very rigid, mm -hmm. very stable is the name of the game. So the hide glue obviously isn't sufficient for keeping it stable. No, the hide glue is just temporary to get us into this state where the painting is put back together and where the face is registered and aligned. The hide glue obviously isn't supportive enough to run it through the rig, so we're gonna need to create a stronger support. What is that gonna look like? What we are going to do is create an armature on the face of the painting. So okay. if you wanna help me flip this over, let's go this way. Okay. So 
So painting is still covered in grime and old varnish. You can see there's plenty of hide glue all over the place. I'm not concerned about any of that stuff. This is all going to come off when we um, do the cleaning. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to face the painting okay. with washi. And then we're going to build an armature on it. And so we're going to take these pieces of poplar, mm -hmm. and we're going to find the curvature of the panel in four or five or however many places we feel is necessary. Mm -hmm. Cut it out onto this poplar, yeah. and then bond the poplar down to the face of the painting. Mm -hmm. In I have four pieces here. Um, we may need more. We may not. We'll have to just kind of play it by ear and see how we feel. Okay. But this is the initial idea. So it's something where you kind of like put it flush to the wood and then you sketch it out and then you plane it out or do you like Well, that'll that'll work for the these, ones, these right, edges. These ones I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, well, I mean, so you just kind of have to create a scribe. Okay. And, you know, there's nothing complicated about it. You just create um, create an offset and as uh, the bottom guide mm -hmm. follows the contour the contours reflected on the pencil above Sweet. and transferred onto the wood. So it will give us an accurate representation of this curve. Mm -hmm. um, and what we'll probably do to compensate for any slight irregularities is probably put a piece of felt okay. on the wood once we have it gotcha. so that when we bond that to the washi kozo, we can clamp it down mm -hmm. and we're not going to create any distortions because it'll be a little bit of give. Okay. All right, so let's lift it up, and I'm going to come over to you, and then we're going to spin it. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's just set it down like that. So once we build the armature, the wood will be, you know, right there. yeah, up nice. here, and now we have contact with the uh, with the bit. So the bit will run along this seam, mm -hmm. and what we'll end up doing is using this as the guide, mm -hmm. we will take out effectively this mm -hmm. from the wood, and then we can create the inlay okay. and then bond it into place. So I know that that's just a, an example. We're not necessarily going to be going at that angle specifically. Mm -hmm. It might be like a... Yeah, this is a 90 degree uh, piece of wood. Okay. This is just the demo, you know, because okay. it's easy to set this up. This is actually 120 degrees, so it's a, a little bit more uh, obtuse. Yeah, because so. it's such a thin piece of wood. Right. It's such a thin piece of wood that if we had a really shallow angle, mm -hmm. we wouldn't get as much surface area, right. and that's, that's what you what said about for. wanting to distribute the pressure so it doesn't snap. And right, okay. right. So, um, but we also don't want to get Crazy, <laughs> like <laughs> right, right. We're trying to remove only what's necessary. So, 120 degrees, I think, is going to work for us. It's going to give us the maximum surface area without compromising either the panel or the inlay. Mm -hmm. And then, once that's done, we will be able to glue it back into place. And we'll probably keep the armature on until that step is all complete, mm -hmm. because we have it. It will be on there, holding it, protecting it, keeping it stable. Why wouldn't you? Right. And then, of course, we'll probably take it back to the clampinator to do the bonding of this because we want to have even pressure along. And we'll still use hide glue for that? We will not, okay. actually. Uh, hide glue is really great, right? It, it's, it's a wonderful product, but it's also got a lot of compromises. Okay. And those compromises are going to be critically important uh, when we deal with this panel. It's hygroscopic, mm -hmm. so it absorbs moisture. Which is already really bad for wood. <laughs> right, which is bad for wood. And we don't want this bond to expand and contract. Mm -hmm. I'm just not convinced that it's the right adhesive for this job. So what we're going to be using is a two-part uh, an epoxy. Okay. Which is very controversial for us because it's not reversible, right? Right. But we are going to be using an epoxy that was uh, used in Europe and still is quite a bit because it's specifically de designed for wood. It has the same mass and density as wood, oh. and it, uh, when dry, um, it tools and carves like wood. Oh, that's cool. So it's used a lot in conservation of furniture and wooden artifacts because it is the closest adhesive to natural wood. Mm -hmm. Even if we used hide glue, there would be no way to simply easily reverse it. Mm -hmm. It would have to be mechanically removed, mm -hmm. physically removed. And again, that sounds crazy, but this is a common practice. and. Again, I consulted the Getty Conservation's massive tome on panel painting conservation, and this approach has been understood to be okay when there is no other 
avenue. Right. You know, we're not taking this lightly. Removing wood, adding wood, using an epoxy, these are not decisions that are our first choice. Mm -hmm. We run through all of the other options, and when we can't find other options that are suitable or great, then we come to these. Mm -hmm. So I want an incredibly strong, incredibly rigid uh, glue joint. And for that, I'm going to be using a two-part epoxy. And if it ever does need to be removed, just like all the paintings and museums that have inlays, mm -hmm. those will have to be removed manually. Okay. All right, so with all of that being said, uh, next step is facing. Mm -hmm. uh, y you feel comfortable facing this one? Yes. All right, you can face it. I will start uh, prepping this and um, getting ready for the exoskeleton to go on. Sweet, okay. All right. Sounds good. Let's get to it. Nice. There is nothing like being prepared, and with Squarespace, that's exactly what you get. A comprehensive solution to all of your web needs. Everything from beautifully designed templates that work everywhere, from mobile devices to desktops. A complex suite of analytics that will allow you to see what's happening with your website so you can make informed decisions. An e-commerce solution that will allow you to sell your products or services online or sell memberships or access to online classes. Even the ability to schedule appointments through your website. And if you still don't feel prepared, Squarespace can help connect you with a professional who will pick up the slack to make sure you can focus on your work, even getting an awesome domain name. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So now that we have an idea of what we are going to try to attempt, <laughs> we have to get doing. And that all begins with facing the painting. So I've asked Git to do so with a heavy washikozo. Something a little bit heavier than we normally use because this is a situation where that is appropriate. Even though this painting has a layer of grime and old varnish on it protecting it, that's not enough for what we're about to attempt. And so the extra support and stability comes in the shape of a heavy washikozo. Now the amazing thing about washikozo is not only that it is super strong, but it's also flexible. And so when we add this fish gelatin to the washikozo, it starts to conform to the painting. Now this painting doesn't have a lot of impasto, so there's not a lot to conform to, but we want to make sure that every single millimeter of paint is bonded to this washikozo. Not just for protection, but because we want a release or barrier layer for the craziness that's going to happen after this washikozo is all dry. So Kit is going in a Union Jack approach, which allows her to move all of the air bubbles and wrinkles to the corners where they can be dealt with, much like we stretch a painting. Once the Washikozo is dry, I'm going to go ahead and start marking off some points on the panel's surface with some chalk. And then I'm going to take a whole bunch of strips of poplar. This is just general lumber, but it's all true and straight. I'm going to lay them down across the painting where I've made those marks put a two by four on them just to hold them in place. And then taking a little scribe that I've made with felt on the bottom, holding a mechanical pencil, I'm gonna transfer the arc of that panel to each of these strips of poplar. The scribe does a really good job of getting an accurate transfer of this curvature. And the whole point here is that I want these ribs to match the curvature of the panel precisely. So one done, on to the next, then the next, and then the next. And then once I've transferred the shape of this panel and numbered each one of these ribs, I can take them over to the bandsaw and cut them out. This is one of those cases where if I had to do this with hand tools, I would be very, very frustrated. The bandsaw makes quick work of this and I can get really accurate cuts. It does take a little bit of time, but I have plenty of time, and there's no way to rush this and get good results. And so one, the next one. And then the next. And the next one. And then one. the next. And you guessed, and it, you guessed it. The next. The next one. With all of these ribs cut out, I can transfer them over to the painting and see if they fit. This would be the time when I would do any handwork to shape them, to modify them, or cut them over if they didn't fit. But look at that. 
I measured right, I transferred the curvature correctly, and they fit really well. So now I need to bond them to the face of this painting, or to the washikozo. And I thought about a lot of different adhesives I could use. Wood glue, conservation adhesive that's heat activated, epoxy, but I ultimately settled on double-sided tape. Now this is an industrial double-sided tape that woodworkers often use, and it's really, really sticky. It's really, really strong. But it's going to release, and that's why I decided to use it. If I had used a glue, I would be worried that it would penetrate through the washikozo and bond to the surface of the painting, and then releasing it may not be possible, or it would take some of the paint with it. But this double-sided tape will give me enough adhesion, but not so much that I can't get it off. Remember, it's only going to bond to the surface of the washikozo, so that's all I need. So I will peel off the other side, and then I will stick it down to the washikozo, again, where I made those chalk marks, because that coincides with the curvature that I transferred to these pieces of poplar. It's not terribly complicated, but I'm taking my time because I want these to fit precisely. The whole point here is that the wood fits the panel, not the panel fitting the wood. I don't want to flex the panel to this wood in any way, shape, or form. So I've got them stuck on, and now I can flip the painting over and really press them down. I didn't want to press the ribs onto the painting because the painting is flexible. With these ribs resting against the table, I can press down on the painting. But before I do that, I'm going to trim off all of that extra washikozo because it's getting in the way, and it will get in the way for the next steps. So with it all removed, I can start pressing the painting down onto these ribs. And you can see, the painting really isn't moving. Finally, I'm going to take some offset clips and just make sure to put them at the edges of the painting where the ribs are for a little ancillary support. This is just to make sure that if something comes detached, it doesn't completely flip over and off. So now we have a reinforced panel, or kind of a reinforced panel, but it's still not really all that strong. It still can flex, and I'm still not satisfied with this exoskeleton. So I'm going to make more exoskeleton. I've ripped down some lumber, and I'm going to bond these pieces of lumber to the ribs that are bonded to the face of the painting. And to do that, I'm just going to use some ordinary wood glue. I thought about mechanical fasteners, but that runs the risk of damage. And this doesn't have to carry any weight. It's not structural. This is just to hold everything in place temporarily. So I'm okay if it's just a glue joint. And frankly, the glue joint is going to be totally satisfactory. If this were a table or a chair or, I don't know, something else, then maybe these little spots of glue wouldn't be strong enough. But here they are. So once I've applied the glue and aligned everything, I'm going to take some of my weights and apply them down onto the painting, just so that there's a little bit more than gravity, making sure that glue is tight. And now, on to the real show. I'm going to take this assembly, the panel with its exoskeleton, and I'm going to slide it underneath this jig. It's going to sit flush with the table, which is flat and level, and going to allow me to position it where I want. I'm going to do a couple of fidgets here and there to make sure that the panel is exactly where I need it, and then I'm going to secure it to the table. And I'm simply going to drill through this exoskeleton cradle and screw it down to the table. I want it to be rock solid. And then, at each seam, I'm going to measure from the table to the face of the painting. And I had 44.8 millimeters on one side, and 45.08 on the other. That's pretty, pretty close, and I'm okay with that delta. So now, everything is in place, everything is secure, and we are ready to proceed. And this is a process that I did not take lightly. I thought about this for weeks and weeks, ran through it in my head, on paper. Kit and I even built this jig and made several practice panels onto which we could perfect this. Running a power tool over a painting is not a light proposition, and we wanted to account for everything that could go wrong and catch it before it did. So once we're comfortable, we can turn on the router, turn on the vacuum, and begin. And I am using a 120 degree V blade on my router bit to remove little amounts of wood. 
The initial pass that I'm making is so shallow that for the majority of the pass, it's not even cutting into the wood. The panel isn't even, if you remember, there are high spots and low spots. And on this first pass, all I'm really doing is hitting the high spots and checking to make sure that my line is exactly aligned with the joint. On the second pass, we can start moving down and removing a little bit more material. But even still, I'm removing, what, barely a 32nd of an inch? You can see how little I'm removing. And that's by design. There's no benefit to going fast. We can take as many passes as we want and check along the way to see if everything is going according to plan. And thus far, everything looks great. All of our preparations, all of our practice has led us to this moment where we feel really confident in what we're doing. So we will make several passes, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, however many it takes to get this painting and this groove where we want it. And what we're targeting is to get the groove as deep as possible while not breaking through the front of the painting, which would be catastrophic. What we want is to leave about two millimeters of wood before we hit the face. And there you can see it, about two millimeters. So with the first groove done, I can take a little piece of wood that's 120 degrees and check to see if it's at the right angle and if it fits flush. And it does. And that means that we are ready to bond in the wedge that we've prepared this panel to receive. I'm taking some tape and I'm masking off the back of the panel because I don't want to create a mess when I use the adhesive. Unlike the person in the past who just squirted glue all over the back, that won't cut it for me. It's also much easier to spend a little time on the front end and less time cleaning up on the back end. Plus, I have tons of this tape and why not? After a lot of research, I settled on using a two-part epoxy to bond this inlay into the panel. And I chose a two-part epoxy as opposed to something like hide glue because hide glue is hygroscopic and so any humidity changes will cause it to swell and ultimately this glue joint could fail and I don't want that. Now the use of two-part epoxy seems wild and crazy because it doesn't fit the bill of completely reversible and archival, but in fact the use of epoxies in conservation is nothing new. It goes back decades for furniture conservation, stone conservation, and yes, even panel conservation. There are tons of examples of using two-part epoxy throughout Europe and the Americas to facilitate structural repairs on wood panels. The use of the hide glue earlier was just to facilitate getting the panel into its correct shape so that we could put this exoskeleton on, enable us to use the router to create this channel in order to bond this piece back in. And I chose a two-part epoxy with a very specific set of characteristics. It has a 0% elasticity, it won't shrink during the curing process, it's slightly flexible so it will yield to some of the movement of the wood to humidity changes, and it has the same density as red oak. So if ever it needs to be removed, it will act just like an extension of the wood, and regular woodworking tools will easily handle it. The use of the two-part epoxy was not a decision that I took lightly. I did tons of research, and I reached out to some experts in the fields of adhesives, wood conservation, and object conservation to get their opinions on this approach. And ultimately, everything came down to the idea that the conservator's job is to preserve the expression of the artist. And sometimes that means that we need to make compromises, like removing some of the structural wood in order to bond the panel back together so that the image can be viewed as a whole. These are compromises. Conservation is filled with them. There is no perfect. It's a delicate balance of choosing the best that we have now in pursuit of the ultimate goal, preserving the image. A few days later, after the epoxy has been allowed to cure under some weights, we can remove all of those weights and we can check on the work. The epoxy didn't expand or contract because it's epoxy. The wood didn't move because everything was in a jig and being held down by pressure, and everything looks exactly like we want it. On top of which, there's no mess, there's not a lot of glue squeeze out. Now, of course, this piece of wood is proud. You can see it's standing up by design. I made it bigger because it's always easier to remove wood, and we will get to that. But look at how perfectly it fits. Exactly what I wanted. 
So now on to the second one, which at this point feels really easy because we just did it. You know, altogether, doing one of these only took about 25 minutes, maybe a half an hour. Kit and I were so surprised at how little time it actually took, and Kit pointed out that the reason it took so little time is because everything went according to plan. And everything went according to plan because I racked my brain and stressed out about it for weeks and weeks ahead of time. So it really is a testament to all of the practice before the performance is where the mastery comes. Once you get to the stage, if you're confident and you know what you're doing, it's just a matter of execution. But it's up until that point, that's where the hard work comes in. And all the hard work that we did, all of the research, all of the preparing, all of the planning, all of the testing, it's not all for naught in this case, because it has yielded results that are exactly what we were going for. And that doesn't come by accident. Now, I did both of the routings because, well, this was a pretty serious procedure, and I actually don't think Kit would have done it, even if I offered. Spoiler, I did offer, and she said no. She was happy to watch, but she didn't feel comfortable yet doing such a high-stakes procedure. And I respect that. If she didn't feel ready, I wasn't going to force her. But I did force her to glue up this one, partially because I was tired but also because I thought it was important that she had some experience. And you can see we're doing a lot of talking. I'm explaining what she should look for, what kind of consistency she wants, how she should hold the glue spreader, all of the things that she needs to know and be cognizant of as she does this procedure. Because hopefully one day, Kit will be able to do these procedures on her own, whether in my studio or her own. That's kind of the whole point of having an apprentice or an assistant, is not to just make them do your dirty work. I make Kit do plenty of that. She will attest to that. But it's also to give them the opportunity to experience things that they would never otherwise have the chance to experience. Something like this is something that most assistants, most apprentices don't get to see. And so I wanted to make sure that Kit got as much out of this experience as she could. I really wanted her to try using the router, but I respected the fact that she didn't feel ready for it. Now next time, she will have to use the router, come hell or high water. After a few more days, we can take off those weights and check that joint. Now at this point, we're done with the router jig, and so we'll remove it and set it aside. I cannibalized all those extra parts from the clampinator and use them to build the new jig. And I'm not naming it. Don't ask. I've learned my lesson. I'm taking a Japanese flush cut saw and I'm going to remove some of the excess wood. And then I'm going to get to the shaping. Now, because I made these inlays proud by design, I have to remove some wood so that they're flush. And that all begins with a hand plane and just slowly trying to remove some of the wood. The panel is still in the jig, so any pressure that I put on the panel is received by the jig, which holds its shape. And there's really nothing complicated about this, except I don't want to remove any of the original wood. So I'm cheating my plane. I'm curving it, I'm tilting it, I'm bending it, and kind of manipulating it so that I'm just hitting the inlay. And the wood isn't even flush. So I have to kind of plane it on an angle in certain spots. And then in certain spots, it shifts to the other angle. So it's really complicated and kind of irregular, and it's more sculpting than it is planing. But I start with the plane because it's the easiest way to remove some of this wood. Once I've gotten it relatively where I want, I can clear off all of these shavings and I can switch to a different tool. I can check it and make sure it's good before I switch to a card scraper. Now a card scraper is a piece of hardened steel with a little burr on the edge. And what it does is remove very, very, very thin shavings of the wood, less than a plane. It's really just scraping the surface. And here I'm doing it just to make sure that the edge of the inlay matches up with the edge of the original wood. Once I'm happy with that, I can turn my attention to the edge and I can cut off the remainder of the wood. 
And then I can take a very sharp Japanese chisel and begin shaping that because I want it to match and be completely flush. Oak is a hard wood and it takes a couple of passes even with a razor sharp chisel, but eventually once I get there, it matches so well that you can't even feel it. And it's really pretty. At this point, I did want Kit to take over, and I'm not sure she was really relishing this opportunity to do some hard backbreaking work, but them's the breaks. And yes, I know that Kit and I are both matching, but we were in synchronicity, both in our wardrobe and in the work we were doing. We worked for an hour or two, just slowly making sure that we got the wood down to the level that we wanted and shaped according to the back of the original panel. And checking it periodically was really key because it was really irregular. And then, moment of truth, we could remove it from the jig. Out came the screws, off came the offset clips. We flipped it over and used a couple of padded blocks to make sure that the panel was resting in its curved shape, that it wasn't gonna rest on its edges. And then a hammer and a couple of taps and I was able to break free the first layer of exoskeleton. Remember when I said I was just gonna use a little bit of glue to temporarily hold it in place? This is why. If I overdid it, taking it apart would have been really difficult. After that, it was time to remove the ribs with the tape. And you can see, just by flexing them a little bit, twisting them, they pop right off. In some spots, some of the washi kozo comes with, but that's okay, no paint came with. And there you have it. One panel, structurally sound. The next step is removing the washi kozo facing. So on a new table with those padded blocks, we lay the panel down, and then using some warm water, we will simply expose the washi kozo and the fish gelatin to the water. It will take a few minutes, but the fish gelatin will soften up and become soluble, and that will allow us to start peeling back this washi kozo. As we peel it back, you may notice how brown or yellow it is. That's because the fish gelatin and washi kozo has absorbed some of that surface grime, so it's kind of a two for one, protects the painting and cleans it a little bit. We'll make a couple of passes to remove any residue, and then we'll call it a day, satisfied with the work we've achieved. But that's not all, because next time we're going to clean the painting, fill it in, retouch it, varnish it, and deal with the frame. So stay tuned.